Let's talk about Fred again. He's one of the biggest producers at the moment. And today I want to give you five techniques, five music production techniques that we can learn from him that are going to make you a better producer and you can apply them today in your DAW. Let's get straight into it. So here we are in Ableton and let's discuss point number one, the drone. The drone is nothing more than a sustained synthesizer tone that's always playing the same note. One single note and it gives context or ambience or vibe or life to all the rest of the elements that you're going to be putting into your composition. Fred discusses his drones quite extensively in his two tape notes podcasts, which you can watch on or which you can listen to, I guess, on Spotify. They are amazing and I highly recommend them. Basically, all the tape notes podcasts are amazing. But specifically, Fred discusses his drones and he says that if you play the fifth note of the scale, that's the sweetest note that you can choose for the drone. And if you play the third note of the scale, that's much more tension. There, there's a lot more tension and ambiguity in that drone. So in this case, I opted for a drone on the third note of the scale. We'll get into the music theory later, but the scale in question for this song would start here and we would create a major scale over it like this. Up. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so the third note of the scale here is what I did for the drone. You could also use the fifth note of the scale, but that would give a different emotional flavor to the song. Now, point number two is about filters and how Fred again brings in elements with filters. So let's add in the main musical hook, which is being muted entirely by this filter. And let me slowly open the filter. Can you feel that? Feel it coming? Feel how you want more? Yeah, you want more, you want more, you want more. And as you open it more, and then you can close it. There we go. So this element can go from dark, and it comes out from underwater with this low pass filter. And Fred does this a lot. So hiding elements, muting them like this, slowly fading them out, and bringing them back in. And it gives this kind of feeling like you're underwater, like it's in a dream, elements are coming and going. It's much better, or it's a different technique than just fading things out with audio. And you can bring in a very complex element gradually and people are not gonna be overwhelmed with it. Because if you just brought this element in from nothing, you know, let's say I bring it in there. It would be like, woof, that's, that's a big musical element to just introduce like that, right? But if you introduce it with the filter, people get used to the, the rhythm of it and they want more. Excellent. At this point, it's also worth noting that this entire element has some really, really heavy LFO tool on there as well, which adds to that underwater kind of feeling. This is like sidechain compression, similar to sidechain compression on the kick. If you turn this off, notice how the volume stays consistent and with the, with the drums. It's not bad, but it's not pulsating as one. And when you do this, now the drums have a lot more impact. See that? Cool. Okay, so the third technique that I want to discuss with you are rhythmic pockets. So Fred again uses this uh, terminology quite regularly, which is rhythmic pockets, which is, let's, let's, let's call them within his beat, places where he places the accent, which causes syncopation. If you can't remember exactly what syncopation is, watch this video, I go into it a lot deeper. But basically, we're talking about stressing weak beats in the groove. Let me play you a version of this track without highlighting the rhythmic pockets here. So here, the stress of the first beat is always at the same time as the kick drum. Now let's switch to the one where the rhythmic pockets are more accentuated. Do 
you hear the difference? So let me explain to you exactly what's going on. If you look here uh, at this as, for example, one instance of a loop, which has 16 16th note steps inside of it, right? You have all of these steps here, and we are accentuating this step, which is the one just before where the kick drum would lay. So if I would mark this red, right? This is the step where the kick drum falls, and instead we are highlighting the 16th note before it, so that it feels like da 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 so da kick right instead of da 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 kick da 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 kick instead we go da 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 kick da 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 kick accenting this little weak 16th note creates an enormous amount of syncopation in this beat and again let's go for the one without so you can appreciate what it sounds like without it Not bad, but less effective, makes you want to dance less. Makes you want to dance less, and this track is obviously meant to represent a dance floor track. By the way, if you like this kind of video, do like it and subscribe and leave me a comment. This helps with the algorithm. I would appreciate the heck out of it. Thanks in advance. I'm going to put this project file on Patreon, by the way, and on Patreon, I'm also going to do a fuller track analysis video. On the main Underdog channel, it's hard for me to use original copyrighted material because I really, really don't want to risk some kind of copyright strike. But on Patreon, I want to do more track analysis videos where we go more in-depth analyzing tracks. And so this particular track, which is Delilah, by Fred again. I'm going to do a more thorough analysis of it there, so head on over there if you're into that kind of stuff. As an in-between bonus technique, I want to show you something that Fred does at the very beginning uh, of the loop. What he does is he interrupts almost everything and he plays a little vocal sound. So he goes like this. Which just, when, when you come up to the transition, it gives you a little surprise rather than just going straight into the loop. You can consider it kind of like a marker just to start the loop, but I call this a little drop step because you, you don't get, for example, the hi-hats there. You are missing a couple of elements and it creates a little bit of a sense of space, like you're falling into the loop. I quite like this. This is the drop step. There's of course a little silly vocal in there because I don't have access to the original vocal. But basically what you do is, on all the important musical parts, you mute them. See here, I've automated a utility to be minus infinity at this exact moment. And so we get... We, I've muted the first bass note, I've only got the first kick drum, and then I've added in just a vocal and some reversed white noise. That gives you the feeling that you're falling into the loop. It gives you this, the moment which should be like a robust arrival into the loop actually is like a little bit of a, a switch up. Uh, I call this a drop step. I don't know if that actually has a, uh, a formal term. I really like it and Fred again uses it all the time. Now just for fun, of course, I had to record some vocals. It's nowhere near as good as the original, but um, here they come now. Cool. And so one tip that I wanted to give you from Fred again, from his Tape Notes podcast, is that when he's recording his own vocals, his favorite microphone to use is in fact his iPhone microphone. Because he hates stepping up to like a high quality mic and pretending that he's a singer because he doesn't feel or identify as a singer. So what he does instead is he goes to an outside space, a place that's not formal, not a recording booth or anything, and he sings in to his iPhone like this, into, his, into just the voice notes. And then with the voice notes, sometimes he even sends it to someone on WhatsApp because he loves the audio compression inside of the voice notes and inside of WhatsApp. So for those of you who think that audio quality is like a linear thing where it goes from worst to best, I wanna impress on you the fact that that's not the case. Everything is just a vibe. So low quality is just a vibe and high quality, high fidelity, high sparkle is just a vibe. So you don't need a super high quality 
microphone to be able to get started in music. Just work with the vibe of the gear that you've got. Remember, people are creating plugins that simulate tape hiss and even MP3 artifacts into your music. So that means that in the composition process, I would say that audio quality is mostly about vibe, not about fidelity. If you're a mixing and mastering professional, it's a different story, but that's not what this is about. Okay, and the last tip is about chords. Fred again uses a beautiful, beautiful chord in this song. And so I think I should go over to my piano and show you this beautiful chord. All right, and so this point is about music theory, specifically one chord that Fred again uses that I find absolutely beautiful that you can use as well. And more specifically, I'm talking about the third chord of the scale, but the variation of it that is the seventh chord. Let me walk you through what that means and why it's so beautiful. Okay, so for counting purposes, I'm going to consider that this song is in B flat major, okay? You might feel like it's in a different scale, but I like to bring everything back to its relative major so that all the counting that I do in all my music theory analysis all lines up together to the same numbers. So if this is the first degree of the scale, this is the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and the first again, okay? So that's how we're gonna count today. And so specifically, I want you to pay attention to one, two, to the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. These are going to be our star players today, okay? So the, the, the chords of the song, they start with the four. Then we play that again. Then we're going to go to the six. And in this hand, I'm just going to play that by lowering this one. All right, cool. And then we're going to play the three. This seems simple enough, but we're not actually gonna play the three like this. What we're gonna do instead is we're going to play in the right hand, we're gonna play the fifth chord instead. So instead of playing this, we're gonna play this. And together, they create a seventh chord. Because usually when you just create a triad, this is the triad over the third degree, right? Simple, simply three notes. Well, if you add on this one, it becomes a seventh. And you basically have the fifth chord here over the root of the third. And so we can invert things around a little bit by moving this one down and moving this one down here. And suddenly we get the following. Now, why is this special? Well, there's a lot of different reasons why this is special. Usually when I teach the basics of music theory, I teach triads. I teach triads that are shaped like this. Bim, one, two, three, right? I rarely go into the seventh because that adds a certain complexity of color that for beginners is maybe a bit too much. So when you start doing music theory, you might feel like your chord progressions are a bit simple feeling. They lack a kind of a, a richness and depth and so what we have here is we've got simple triad, simple triad, and then suddenly jazzy chord. If you would not make this a seventh chord and instead you would just play the fifth, let me, let me show you with a bit more rich left hand what that would sound like. So, so, bum, so. Sounds fine, right? But this sounds less deep than this. So, compare this to this. So, so we got a simple chord, simple chord, rich chord. Or we can do a simple chord, simple chord, simple chord. So, do you see the nuance here? It's subtle, and if you're not used to music theory, it might be lost on you a little bit, but take it away as a concept like this. If you're doing chord progressions for electronic music, two super safe chords that you can always use are the four and the six. I would say that more than 50% of electronic music songs uses those two chords. They're really super safe. And so if you're gonna use those two chords in your chord progression, you might wanna spice it up with something a bit more unique. And this spicy third chord is exactly one example of how you could do it. You go from simple chord, simple chord, to this spicy third chord. The four and the six are very much in my comfort zone. This spicy third chord, 
less. So I'm going to be working a little bit on incorporating that. And some of you in the comments are going to be saying, Oscar, this song sounds like it's in a minor key, right? But remember what I was saying, I like to bring everything back to its relative major key so that the counting that I do is always the same. So I'm used to having a major one and a major five. And if the song puts a lot of emphasis on the six chord, then we can kind of consider that it's probably in the relative minor. So this is just a counting convention. This is not really saying anything about the mood of the song. And this song, it goes from the four to the six, which to me, if you ask me what scale is it in, I'm probably gonna say it's in a minor scale, but I'm gonna start counting from B flat major. That was five production tips that you can take away from Fred again. Like I said, the project files on Patreon, go support me there and maybe watch the track analysis while you're at it. Come show us on the Discord channel what you did with this. Come follow one of my courses on courses.underdog.brussels. I have a foundations course there where I take absolute beginners to become intermediate level producers. Do that if any of this went a bit too fast for you. Leave a comment to show me some love and to tell me what other producers you'd like me to analyze. And until next time, stay producing, be good to one another and take care. Bye-bye.